I think in this in this environment, I think uh, uh, change has to come far faster than where it's been coming. And I can see. I think in this in this environment, I think uh, uh, change has to come far faster than where it's been coming. And I can see the differences in climate, the differences that we've found over the years. I think it's really important that we're doing everything we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. I'm concerned that we're not doing enough now. We probably need to get there quicker than we're moving at the moment. I hope we will move quick enough, and we certainly need to move quicker than we are now. So we've got to learn from that generation coming through, and by, by taking the learnings, how do we meaningfully uh, apply that into to, to daily business? We see what's happening with climate change, and we've all got a part to play. It's not about switching conventional energy off, because we can't do that. I think that anything we can do that will have a wide-reaching effect on, on, on the world is something that's worth doing. It will take time, yeah, but certainly what we're doing with uh, offshore wind, that's big steps forward in, in reduction of carbon. What I've seen, very strong foundations are laid. Now it's really starting to build on that. The, the changes that are going to come, this is the first of them, and maybe one of the biggest, but it's not going to be the last. Nature will start showing the world what has to happen. And you'll, when you start seeing nature taking over and showing people what's actually happening, then you'll start seeing a bigger response. You can't go backwards. All you can do is start now. And we need to be starting now. Our planet is changing. Global rising temperatures, devastating forest fires, rising sea levels and unthinkable biodiversity loss. Our beautiful Mother Earth is fast becoming unrecognisable from the safe, pale blue dot we all call home. This has to be the decade for choice and change. To put our planet back on track and to pivot towards a future that is fairer, cleaner, and more secure for all. And change must come. It has to be all of us. It has to be now. Scotland has always been at the forefront of invention. Innovation is in our DNA. It's who we are. It's what we do. We strive to write the next chapter of our history. And the climate challenge is no different. My name is Hannah Mary and I entered the energy industry to be the change that I needed to see in our world. I had an idea to showcase the very best of what the industry in Scotland has to offer. Real change is happening, right here, right now, and this story needs to be told. This idea became a reality when I teamed up with three of my friends, Michael, Anna and Craig, traveling across Scotland from Aberdeen to the Northern Isles, through the Highlands and down to the Central Belt. We went on a journey. This is our story, and this is what we found. When faced with a challenge as enormous as climate change, our natural reaction is to turn to technology, smart solutions that we believe are the answer. Throughout our journey, we were privileged to see some incredible technology. From the world's first floating wind farm to carbon capture and the largest offshore tidal array, we saw firsthand the technologies and the people that are making a difference within our energy industry. But what became clear to us along our journey is that technology and innovation will only take us so far. The missing piece of the puzzle is far deeper and far more complicated than we had ever realized. It requires us to dive deep into the realms of what it means to be human, to live a life that is sustainable, to provide for our generation, but to ensure that we don't sacrifice the needs of the next generation. 
It requires a radical reset of our behavior. It's having that long-term view and that long-term vision as to how you want to leave the world. You don't plant an apple tree for like this year because you're not going to get apples off it this year. You're planting that apple tree so that your kids can have it or the people who are in the house next can have apples. So it's, it's that long-term view that we, we need to do. You can't just depend on the next generation. I think the young people are far more savvy on what has to be done. You know, am I hopeful? Very much. I, I don't just think that we'll get to net zero and we'll do it with lower carbon. I think we'll do it with better cars and warmer homes and everybody will be more comfortable. And um, yeah, so the, the future is very bright, I think, in terms of our journey to net zero. Throughout our journey, it was comments like these about mindset coming from leaders within the industry that gave us hope that real change is not that far off and that it is possible. Every person we spoke to from every company big and small, had these passionate views that we felt needed to be heard. For me personally, I feel hopeful about the future of energy. I think we're on the right track as an industry. I think the oil and gas industry and the renewables industry are working together for long-term solutions. I think it's less siloed. It's not just renewables versus oil and gas. The sectors have merged, they're meeting together to look at new solutions, so I feel positive. We have a really good relationship with the fishing community based here in Wick. You know, uh, we've regenerated the harbour. Um, we work with the fishing communities and all on the other users of the sea. You know, we need we need to work hand in hand here. In the West, our, our responsibility in the energy transition is going to be to recognise that not all countries can move at the same pace. I think certainly in, in the early stages of it, it'll be important for us to offset other countries as they try and ramp up and catch up with us. So we, we might have to gear up faster than we think we do in order to counteract other countries as they try to catch up and le level everything out. Collaboration is key for this energy transition to work. That is clear, but how do we communicate that across sectors, to the public, and to what level does this need to take place in order to keep pushing forward to make net zero a reality? Understand that it's going to take more than just one individual or one organisation to come up with a solution. We need to fail fast here, move quickly uh, and, and have confidence that our ability to generate solutions and evolve as an industry, we've already established. So how can we use that and be braver in our thinking and bolder in our thinking moving forward? It's a step change for a lot of people to, to change the way, the attitude towards how we use our the, the natural resources we have. Is that, is that resource one-time use or is it a renewable source? And you can apply that to everything. You know, everything that you do, you can apply that, that simple question. And that, that sort of societal shift has to happen, well, it has to happen quickly, but it tends to only happen with very little friction. So people, people and communities will be attracted towards this, this lifestyle of decarbonisation. I think because their cars will be cleaner and more pleasant, because their homes will be warmer and more efficient. And, um, and I think we are all increasingly aware of the damage we're doing and very keen to ensure that stops. And if we can do that with, with minimal or no impact on lifestyles and societies and, and education and everything that we hold dear, then it gets very easy. Um, anything less than that, we'll need to dig in a little bit deeper and I'm, I still have every faith that we'll, we'll find ways and take the hard steps we need to take to get there. Throughout our travels, we were constantly reminded of how fortunate we are to be able to call Scotland home. We saw the very best of our country, beautiful sunrises, stunning sunsets, and vast oceans that we may take as ours, but in actual fact, connect us worldwide to others. We all take this for granted and don't realize what we have. It's time to look up and pay respect to what surrounds us every day of our lives. This journey was becoming more about action and finding a way forward together. We're taking what we found and sharing it with you in the hope that we can all dig deep, think about our own impact and understand what we need to do to change our course. How do we help one another to get there and get there on time? A huge part of the answer to this lies in the power of education. 
the ability to inspire and encourage the next generation to see the energy industry as the place to make real change. The place to make a difference and the place to solve the challenge of our time. Education can be impacted across all levels, so everywhere from, from primary schools through to apprenticeships and, and further education. We, we'll need teachers of those primary kids to know more about climate change um, because hopefully a great deal of those children will grow up and uh, be involved in net zero. Everywhere from uh, traineeships and apprentices in construction sites and in, in the supply chain, right through to, as I say, technology, technology institutions and um, innovation in our, in our universities. So I think uh, education from um, boardroom right the way down to shop floor is essential. Um, and if that alignment takes place, uh, then I think we're, a, we're going to be in a, a really good place. So knowledge share is, is going to be key. I think you need the different views from people that's kind of been hands on. I don't think you need to go to university. You need to get a boiler suit on and you need to go and work with a tradesman and get on with it. The sooner you can get the reality of a workplace, the sooner you're going to be able to actually contribute and add value and actually get more out of your experience. And so I think it's really important that these, these youngsters and the teachers within the schools and the careers advisors are, are leading them down the right kind of path that, that leads to more practical work because arguably a lot of these people might prefer to go into that area as opposed to being sort of not pushed into further education, but arguably looking to go into that when in fact there's maybe a better route for them, route for them to go. As great as it can be to have a degree, it also is equally important to encourage the practical application of subjects through apprenticeships or trades. The energy industry needs both and the energy transition will not be successful without both. Our journey to net zero also needs to be fair for people and planet. And we need to make sure that we transition more traditional industry workers into good, new, green jobs. So from a people angle and from the skill sets we need, we have the skills. So a lot of the skills exist in oil and gas. They exist in the chemical industries at the moment. Uh, and so we really don't it's just moving those skills into a, a different industry. What I would like to see more of is more public awareness of the energy transition opportunities, a better understanding for people who are you know, highly technical in oil and gas positions to really be supported and to help them understand what their role is in the net zero economy. Nuclear industry is a very highly regulated and highly Te technological uh, area. So, you know, we've got that pool of um, expertise in terms of engineering, uh, regulation, uh, safety performance available to us, uh, very similar to the oil and gas. So there's a pool of resource there that, you know, can, can hopefully transition, similar to oil and gas, transition into, into the clean energy production of, of renewables. We've been delivering conventional energy solutions for our customers across the globe for, for decades. And we see a real transferability in our knowledge of that infrastructure, but also in the skills of our people to pivot towards energy transition. We do need to reskill some people. We do need to transition the skills. We need to upskill. But you can help people to, to face that with less fear by, by giving them more, more understanding of, of where things are going to go. I think that means that Whereas a lot of strategizing is done at quite a high level, I think it's important that it's well publicized at a low level to make sure that the people who, who maybe have the most uncertainty and the most fear about it are also some of the people that are going to hopefully have some of the best understanding. When we were in Shetland, we briefly stopped to see Ninian Northern, an old North Sea oil rig that's in the process of being decommissioned. Rigs like these have powered Scotland for the last 40 years, bringing jobs and success into our communities. Standing in front of this mass of steel being picked apart piece by piece, with wind turbines in full production on the hill behind us, it became apparent that the energy transition is not an abstract concept. It's here and it's happening. And yet there is still so much more that needs to be done and put into place. 
With Scotland having such a proud history in oil and gas, it's no surprise that the energy industry shares the view that the workforce that we already have is fully capable of upskilling and reskilling into a low carbon economy. But do they know that? We need to make sure that we communicate this with impact and conviction. So our workforce understands that they have a significant role to play, that there is a future for them. It's up to us, to our industry, to guide the existing workforce and the generations coming that the energy industry is the place to make serious change towards net zero. But in order for us to make this change, we need support. We need our government to be ambitious, to be brave and to put policies in place that allow for this transition to happen before it's too late. We can't do without hydrocarbons. We need hydrocarbons for lots and lots of things. It's too valuable just to burn. It's too valuable just to stick in your car and, and, and go down the road with it. So it's not just about replacing our power stations, once, and we're doing a very good job of that. But once we succeed in doing that, we'll then need to decarbonise all of transport. So we need to be looking at carbon in a really global way. We, we can't just look at it in one place. There will be countries that will be very hard to decarbonise and renewables is part of the picture of there. But a lot of these, these countries will also have other industries that are vital for the country, but we need to be able to capture that. Um, ideally, we'd be capturing it at source. It's, it's more efficient to capture it at source, but carbon capture is a, another feather in our cap, if you will, that will allow us to decarbonise. The government is already doing a lot, a lot of great things to set pathways and plans and to really do a lot of research into the pathway to net zero. Of course, it's legislated, which is a really big, major step. But I think now what, as a general ask, will be to see a lot of the policy direction, to see all of that really get into action. We need to be doing everything we can to minimise areas in which hydrocarbons are used and government policy needs to reflect this. Government is already paving the way and moving in the right direction, but with fuel poverty increasing and other issues on the horizon, we need to move quickly to offer a fairer life for all and to provide a sustainable planet for generations to come. We, we, we see that fuel poverty is going to be one of the biggest issues uh, as a country, as a renewable energy comes along, the cost of, of installing energy at scale either has to be subsidised to allow people to uh, access this energy, or you've got to utilise the, the, the off-peak or the, the lower demand periods. And that's important because what we want to try to do is not only have clean energy, but have cheap and reliable energy for consumers. It looks we need to look at both ends, not only the generating side of, of clean energy, but also the, the users as well. There's an there investment required all throughout the, from the point of generation to the point of use. Together, if we can solve these kinds of problems and begin to deliver green energy to the population at affordable levels, we will see the benefits that this provides. However, government backing is essential to make these changes a reality. We need to see more ambition from our energy leaders working together with others to make this change happen. We need support from a, a policy perspective, from a government perspective, from a regulation perspective. And we need to get visibility so we can develop a long-term supply chains based in Scotland and in the UK. And I think governments have still got some way to go. So clarity around policy and build-out is absolutely key. At first, you know, is looking after the home front to the supply chain. If the knowledge, the capability at a competitive level and a sustainable level resides within UK, we must be visiting that first. I think the government, eh, along with industry, has to work harder in trying to ensure that the work is, is kept as local as it can be and the skills that are available to allow them do that. So I think to be able to use local suppliers and fabrication yards that can have local guys there and supply the stuff that we need to build our turbines. I think it could have a pretty good knock-on effect. 
I think an area where the government is not doing enough is by being ambitious enough. I, I think it's really important that government listen not just to the, the, the current energy leaders, but also to young professionals. There has to be government support and positive policies on, on, on low carbon and, and a transition period. There have to be. We're certainly not doing anything extreme yet. We all need to get there, such that it isn't even considered to be extreme anymore. We, we need to not be concerned about seeing a wind turbine on the horizon. We need to be proud about the fact that our city is net zero because it is a wind turbine on the horizon. Steps like that are fundamental and it'll take a, a great deal more um, public shift and policy to support and help us all get there. But I also think um, that there's a huge opportunity for governments, local governments, and then, um, you know, the, the significant players in our industries and economies, the, the large companies like the one I work for, to take a significant stand in this and, um, and uh, walk the talk. The energy transition that we are on is not an overnight switch. It's a journey and it will take time. Part of the answer is about an integrated energy system that links existing infrastructure, capitalises on renewable energy sources and exposes the untapped potential of CCS and hydrogen production. But technology and innovation will only take us so far. What is often underestimated is the radical overhaul of our behaviour and mindset. If we manage to get this right, people will be attracted to the shift because our lives will be better. Our homes will be warmer. Our public transport will be comfortable and affordable. Our fashion more durable and our cities more breathable. We will be able to abandon the culture of consumerism. Our lives will be one of quality over quantity and a place of understanding that we all rely on one another. We live in an unbalanced world and we need rebalance now more than ever before. I'm not only hopeful that we'll get there, I'm confident we'll get there. And I'm really, really confident that the, the younger generation coming up will absolutely rise to the challenge. Yeah, I, I believe strongly in, in achieving net carbon zero. What do you want to come home and be able to say you've achieved? I can actively find new ways to provide energy, but at a lower cost to the environment. You know, it's, it's, it's the most meaningful role I ever had in my life. For me, it's a daily motivation to get up early, to start really looking into what we have to do. I think the dream would be to, to see our turbines all over. Everybody has their own choices to make, but this to start with everybody. We're all on this journey together, so we may as well start getting to know each other now. I think we're already getting going with the industry, to be honest with you. Rebalancing will come at a cost. In a world prioritising sustainability, the world's richer nations need to shoulder the bulk of those adjustments. These adjustments to a fairer, more balanced world will need a mindset change, fit for the future. It will need an ambitious education agenda and it will demand a radical policy shakeup with levels of global collaboration that this world has never experienced before. But change must come, and change will come. The question is, are you in?
The question is, are you in? Are you in? This is personal and it's meant to feel personal. Because ultimately, this is the most important question that our energy industry is going to be asked in the next decade. We'll be measured on what we did, and more importantly, how we did it. That's how future generations will look at us. I've never felt more proud to work in the energy industry than I do now. And a lot of that has come from the people that we met along the journey. Their enthusiasm, their passion, and their dedication to get the job done. That was completely infectious. And you know, what's more, it instilled real hope, not some sort of vague, washy hope, but that, that fire in the stomach, sort of hope that gets you out of bed in the morning, that we can do this, and that we will get there together. But one thing became very clear to me as we traveled around Scotland. We don't have time. We don't have time to wait in the wings, hoping that someone is going to give us our cue. The time is now, and the people are us. Now, you will have hopefully picked up throughout the film that the focus on technology was not in the spotlight. And Hannah Mary is going to tell you a little bit about that. OK. We can take this quite ad-lib. It's fine, Craig. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the time is now and the people are us. This diagram behind me uh, really explains quite clearly why the energy challenge is, why the climate challenge is an energy challenge. 75% roughly of the emissions come from our sector or they come from our products. So by default, if the climate challenge is an energy challenge, then it's for the energy industry to really step up here, to be more ambitious. It's for you and I, Craig, it's for us in this room to say, yeah, we're going to roll up our sleeves here and be part of the solution. And I've never felt more optimistic that we will manage to do this. So, as I said a minute ago, you will hopefully have picked up that throughout the film, the focus was not on technology. And this was quite deliberate. As we say, technology and innovation, they will only take us so far. But actually, what is so often underestimated is the overhaul of our behaviour and our attitude and mindset that will be required. Coupled alongside this, we need an ambitious education agenda and really a radical policy shake-up. And what we want to do now is take a couple more minutes of your time to share with you the three main themes that came from our journey and that we believe could help us all as we work together towards a planet that is fairer, greener and more sustainable for all. Now the first of these themes is mindset. Now the hotel, travel and music industries have all gone through major change in the last decade. They've been transformed. We now stream music on our, online, on our phones. We book hotels, we book apartments, lodges, cabs, taxis, again, on smart apps on our smartphones. Now, these changes didn't come from inside those industries. These changes came from people on the outside looking in from a different viewpoint with a different mindset. Now, our energy industry there will be changes found on the inside, but we must also be humble enough to look on the outside and find changes and solutions that lie there as well. Now, the three companies that changed those industries, I'm sure you've heard of all of them, will be Airbnb, Spotify, and Uber. Now, we also want to look at the mindset of business. We need to build business back as a vocation again and be prepared to ask ourselves the question, who do we serve? Now, I believe, we believe, that if we really get under the thick skin of this question, then we can start to balance and bridge the gap between the needs of our shareholders and the needs 
of our stakeholders. And it's at this point where we can really start to deliver profit, but with an actual purpose. Profit with purpose, that's a fairly powerful phrase, Craig. The second of our themes was education. Now I want to do a test here with you. Hands up if you've ever had a mentor. Okay, this is working, this is good. Hands up if you've ever been a mentor. Keep your hand up if that mentor is outside your company. Keep your hand up if that mentor is outside your industry. Okay, and I'm really glad that worked. But the point is clear. The energy industry is very good at mentoring. We're very good at nurturing the next generation, but there was hardly any hands up there at the end. And that's because we make this a very in-house thing. Getting to net zero is going to take levels of cross-sector collaboration that this world has never seen before. So we've got to get better at extending the hand and welcoming others in. We've got to step up with being better role models within society and actually mentorship outside our energy industry four walls. Secondly, under education, it was very clear to us throughout the journey around Scotland that more needs to be done to encourage young folk into the practical application of getting to net zero. And by this I mean skills, I mean trades, and I mean apprenticeships. We've got to guard against the energy transition becoming a middle-class academic project. And I don't say these words lightly. I say them because net zero is going to impact all of us. And it's going to take all of us. So we've got to make sure that the biggest part of society is on board with this. We've got to increase the accessibility to net zero. And we've got to increase the understanding. Because here's the thing. If you understand something, you can be involved. And if you're involved, you can make a change. So our specific ask under this is that we see an increased provision of graduate apprenticeship schemes across Scotland that are both well funded and supported by industry and government. Because net zero and getting there on time is going to take everybody. And the energy industry needs to become better at actually increasing the attractiveness of our graduate schemes, but also our apprenticeship schemes. We need the best apprentices and we need the best graduates. The energy transition is going to take a good balance of both of these. Definitely is. And our third and our final theme this evening is policy. Now you will have heard it said in the film just there that hydrocarbons are too valuable to burn. And I, I want you to think about that for just a minute. That hydrocarbons are too valuable to just burn. Now, I think that's a fantastic statement. It's simple, it's bold, and it's one that we completely agree with. And from this, we want to see a hydrocarbon product strategy, whereby our UK policy is far more prescriptive on where and how hydrocarbon products are used. Now, let me take you back in time a little bit to the mid-1990s. Picture yourself here. You're at a restaurant for dinner. You're with your family. There might be grandparents, parents, your generation, children, grandchildren, maybe even a baby at the table. It's a celebratory meal, and you're probably going to be there for most of the afternoon. Now, let's go further back in time to the 1980s. And again, picture yourself with your family away on a holiday trip. You're going somewhere warm, somewhere hot, and that requires a plane. The plane journey could be three hours, could be six hours. Now, in both of these instances, you were able to smoke in the restaurant and in the airplane. But not today. And that's because of policy and regulation brought in by the governments to limit where we can smoke. Now, some of you might be wondering what I'm getting at here. 
But what we want to see is similar policy brought in on the use of hydrocarbons. A North Sea barrel of oil, we should be limiting where and when and how we can use it. Because it was said that hydrocarbons are too valuable to burn. Now in the film you heard us talk about rebalancing as well. And what do we mean by this? Well, we mean to create a world where all countries have access to resources and they have equal access to these resources and equal access to the value of these resources. Asking the world's poorer countries to sacrifice their own economic growth and their own industrial revolutions for the sake of greenhouse gas emissions is really not on. Now, we've had our economic growth periods. We've had our industrial revolution and we didn't, at the time, need to consider greenhouse gas emissions. So we must rebalance. But rebalancing is going to come at a significant cost. In a world prioritizing sustainability, the developed nations, the richer countries, us, we need to shoulder the bulk of the costs. But how do we shoulder these costs? Well, we believe that we need to get better at exporting our technologies and our skill sets to countries that need them the most. We believe that part of the answer lies in giving a hand up to these countries and not just a hand out. The energy transition is not an overnight switch. This is a journey and it's going to take effort from all of us. We've all got our part to play in this, no matter how big and no matter how small. You might be one of the people that can get up and communicate or be a mover or a shaker or a policy decider. You might be a teacher that's going to inspire the next generation. You might be one of these more considerate listeners that brings people with you and collaborates. No matter what your role is, it matters. Because this takes all of us and it starts with all of us. You know, this could be the most exciting and decisive decade that the energy industry has ever seen. That's our choice. It's up to us. We can choose to be the generation that creates an energy system that's fair, one that's accessible, one that's affordable, one that's sustainable. We can choose to be the generation that demands change and says no more business as usual. The status quo is just not working. That's our choice. And there's only one question left to ask. And it is, are you in? And if your answer is yes, then we can't wait to get working alongside you. Thank you. I would like to now invite um, our panel speakers up onto the, onto the floor. So I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions. I've got, Neil, I think, have we got a running mic? Yeah, we've got a running mic. So if there's any questions, then please just raise your hand. Um, firstly, I'll introduce the panel and then we'll, we'll get straight into the questions. So Ian, actually, I'd like you to introduce yourselves. Um, Ian, you'd like to go first? Very good, me, me to introduce everyone. <laughs> I'm Ian Stewart, I'm a, a, a geologist and a, a kind of broadcaster, and I'm interested in you know, how, how geoscience can get, the role and responsibility of geoscience uh, for the future world, really. So a lot of the, the topics that popped up in the film there is what I'm interested in. And I'm currently in Jordan, in, I'm in, a man in Jordan at the Royal Scientific Society there. Thanks, Thanks. Great. Uh, Evening everyone, I'm Lindsay McQuaid, I'm the Chief Executive of Scottish Power Renewables, part of Scottish Power and part of the Iberdrola Group. We're the third largest utility uh, in the globe and we've got a net zero target. We've got a net zero target in Europe by 2030 and globally by 2050. Um, and we are 100% green already, so we've completely changed our business model, having previously been one of the biggest polluters in Scotland. So 
I'm delighted to be part of the answer, part of the discussion, uh, and completely agree with an awful lot of the sentiment in the video about the, the, the need for policy change, the need for behaviour, the need for buy-in and support and discussion. So looking forward to the questions. Good evening. My name is Al Cook. I head up the international side of Equinor. Uh, that's the Norwegian definition of international, which is everything outside Norway. Um, and Equinor is a company that was founded as uh, an oil company to promote and develop oil in Norway. And since then, we've, we've broadened. And we're now building the world's largest wind farm in the UK and expanding our wind, solar, hydrogen in the UK and elsewhere. Good evening, my name is Nick Waith. I'm the Chief Executive of the Energy Institute and delighted to be here and uh, delighted to have our young professionals putting on such a fantastic show for you tonight. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Anna and I am um, part of the documentary team and I'm really delighted that everyone could be here tonight to be able to see all the work we've put in over the past few months. It's been a great experience for all of us. Yeah, thank you everyone. And thanks for the relatively quick introductions as well. That's great, because <laughs> we don't have that much time. So I'm going to open straight up. Um, does anybody want to raise their hand and ask a question to our panel? No, we were a little bit shy this evening. OK, that's great. I'm going to ask the first question, and then what we'll do is we'll open up again. So my first question is to yourself, Lindsay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> as someone working in renewables now, and as you say, in a green company and the way things have changed, have you noticed a mindset change within the industry of renewables? So have you noticed almost, yeah, that mindset change? So uh, I guess I'm part of the old garden renewables. I've been in, renew well, I've been in energy since 1999. I've been in renewables since 2006. Um, and uh, uh, there's been a change in every sense, I would say. I think uh, the points that were made about looking at a wind farm from your city and being proud of that wind farm and understanding how you react to that and what, what it means to your, your hometown um, is where we are today. Um, that's very different than when we started as Scottish Power Renewables, where people, you know, there was a sense of, of the fear of the unknown. What did it mean? What did it mean for bills? Cost was a big worry. <clears throat> We've obliterated that. It's now the cheapest form of new build generation. Onshore and offshore wind um, will provide the backbone of decarbonised electricity in this country. Um, and it's been fantastic to see, you know, the, the politics around that and the political appetite uh, for, for those sectors to grow. So I, I mean, there has been a notable shift um, in every sense. I, I often reflect on the fact that I sit in Scottish Power Renewables and this is our day-to-day, -day. it's absolutely in our DNA. Um, we don't have to try very hard to think about it but very often we forget that the outside world doesn't have the benefit of that. So it's when I go out and I speak to others and they comment on the projects that we're doing, the innovation work that we're undertaking, um, you know, using wind to provide services to national grids, uh, looking at black start simulations from wind um, and, and having a successful global trial of that. These are world firsts and I'm incredibly proud to be part of, a, of an industry that has that innovative mindset and collaborates far more effectively than, than an awful lot of others. And I think energy folk tend to have that mindset and approach. Uh, we're confronted with a problem and we will solve it. So yeah, yeah definitely a big shift. Great. And then Al, I guess when you maybe first started at Equinor, that's probably a company on the outside that's now building itself onto the inside or inside. Um, have you noticed a mindset change in the workforce of a company like Equinor? Um, absolutely, absolutely. and. I think we understand the scale of what's required to do this. Um, I think we understand the necessity of, of what's required to do this. And I think we understand the pace of what's required to do this. It, it's, it, it's obvious but also shocking that we've never had, we will never have as much time to fix this challenge as we do now. Day by day from now on, the amount of time we have the carbon budget of the world will get less and less and less. I think the point that was made in the movie, and, and by the way, congratulations on the film. I mean, my God, what a beautiful and powerful way of, of setting the challenge. One of the real points that comes across is the nature of the transition. I think at one point someone says, it's not a switch, it's a transition. To me, it's like a, an airplane that takes off, to use your analogy, an airplane that takes off. And as it takes off, it's running on fossil fuels. It takes off on fossil fuels. By the time it lands, 
it has to be zero emission. And while it's up in the air, we have to change it from fossil fuels to zero emission. But we have to do that whilst not pulling it out of the sky. The good news is, and I think this point really came across from the, from the film, is that in companies like our own, in, in your company, in our industry, and on that plane, we've got the people who, because they could run the plane on fossil fuels, they're the very people who can turn it into something that's zero emissions. And that, I think, is what gives us all so much optimism as we come together at COP26. Fantastic. Thanks, sir. Do we have any questions in the audience? I don't know the top there. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, Juliet Davenport, um, Vice President of the EI and founder of a company called Good Energy. Um, really interested by the film. Thank you so much for putting it together. One of the things that came across a lot was this transition in skills, and, and we just touched on it there. Um, I think also a lot of the analysis looking is there's a big skills gap, full stop, whether we transition all the existing skills. There's still going to be a big skills gap. I wonder whether any of the panel have some thoughts about how, one, how are we going to encourage the retraining of skills? Because there may be some resistance to that. And two, what should we be looking at to really bring more skill sets into this industry? Because we're, we're going to need as many as we can get. Would anybody like to take the first, the first answer on that? I'll have a crack, Craig. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Um, thanks, Juliet. It's a great question. And uh, I, mean, I think I mean, the, the film just set out you know, so clearly the challenge ahead of us. And... I got an awful lot of reassurance in terms of the thinking around the transition of skills from the oil and gas sector. I think there is a, there is a mindset issue, and, and I saw this at, at my time in BP before I joined the Energy Institute, people not understanding how the skills of somebody who works in a refinery managing the reliability of rotating equipment is directly applicable to somebody looking after wind turbines, and there are so many examples of that. And I think there's something about just a mindset shift within the industry. I think there is sometimes a bit of a, a bit of a tone amongst some of the people on the more renewable side that we don't want to learn from oil and gas. And I think we need to break that. I think the role of organizations like the Energy Institute, and it's great we've got uh, Alice Bunn, who's the chief exec of the IMECI here. The role of organizations like ours is to break some of those sort of barriers down to provide the training and the education that people need to make that transition. The last point I'll make, and we all know this, the, the demographics, the diversity of the energy sector is frankly woeful. And there is so much more we can do to attract new talent, people from all forms of, of backgrounds, diversity. And that has got to be a key part in, it, in how we deliver. And I'd, I'd go so far as to say, without that diversity, we're not going to deliver the, uh, the energy transition. Interesting. Can I, can I add a point from, <clears throat> from the academic uh, side? Because I, um, I think it's a mindset change more than a skill set change. I think you can... What I see in the universities is, is that we're really struggling because we're looking to industry to see what they need from us. And industry is changing so fast that actually it's not quite clear what the universities need to be doing, what kind of skill sets and mental skill sets and technical skill sets are going to need. And we've got an industry that's becoming completely cross-disciplinary, you know, jumping between wind and solar and kind of conventionals, etc. And if you go back into the universities, they're still in these academic silos. And we need to, you know, if we're to get half, you know, reduce their emissions by half by the end of the <coughs> century, which is the track. That means five, six years of change. That's the time that a person goes through an undergraduate and a master's degree. That's the time where the whole of society has to, to flip. And I think the universities are way behind the curve on this. Not all of them, but most of them. And I think, I think we're doing it piecemeal. So for all those, I mean, I think industry is way ahead of us on this. Industry is just changing really fast. And, and I really worry that we are too slow in the university circuit to, and that, that's going to be a weight pulling the whole thing back. I'd like to come in as well, thanks. Um, I, th I think within our organisation, uh, we recognise the points that have been made about there's just simply not enough talent out there. There's simply not enough people applying for the jobs that we put out there. Um, and that's frustrating because we need 
the resource to help us do the job and deliver the assets, etc. So, you know, I think I think that's that's a huge challenge for us. But I'm always heartened uh, when we've developed innovative programmes. We've got a returners programme at Scottish Power. Um, first off, it was about bringing back uh, mums that had maybe been out of the workforce for some some time. Um, and maybe needed a chance to try and get back into, into the workplace. So we offered a, an opportunity for them to come in and spend some time with us. We've expanded that out now to those that are going through a transitional change from oil and gas into the renewable sector. Um, a lot of applicants we had had an oil and gas CV. They'd then returned to university, done a master's or, or another degree qualification, but just couldn't get a break in the renewable sector because, again, there's probably a bit of preciousness about, well, we're renewables, we'll find somebody that's got renewables experience. Some of those recruits have been absolute stars in our organisation. And that understanding and experience that we can bring in and tap into within the renewable sector cannot be underestimated. Fantastic engineering capability that we've got in this country. And, and encouraging that draw, telling the stories of those that have made that transition. I've also got the team that, you know, they, they used to work in Long Gannett, they now work at Wiley and they love coming to work every day. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's stories like that we need to talk about more. The transition is absolutely possible. It shouldn't be scary. It shouldn't be something that, that people feel that they're, they're losing out, they're giving up. It's an opportunity and we need to celebrate when folk do make that transition. It's a huge success. No, I think that's a good job of answering that question, definitely. Um, I'm now going to go to the TV screen where we have a pre-recorded question from our Ireland branch of the Energy Institute Young Professionals Network. And this question is on technology. Ireland has the highest share of non-synchronous variable renewable electricity on a single synchronous power system with an ambitious 2030 target of 75% renewable energy on the grid. Around 5% of total worldwide battery installations are in Ireland this year. What we are currently witnessing here is climate mitigation policies influencing generation portfolios. As we've all seen from the FE500 tour, the rate of change needs to increase, not only on the integration of variable renewable generation, but also the change in mindsets across the board. We need to have everyone brought along in this journey so that no one is left behind. Ireland and the world face multiple challenges in reconciling ambition for variable renewable integration, market economics and system operation. Energy storage is more than just batteries. It's a combination of ambition and policy from our leaders down and grassroots up, and innovation and training for the energy industry, both old and new. So I ask, how can you, the leaders and influencers in our industry, provide a system that rewards flexible and reliable capacity with the ability to evolve with market conditions of the future? Oh, quite an intense question. Anyone <laughs> <laughs> like to, um, to go first in answering that one? I'll have a go, yeah. if you like. So I, I think you know, flex, flexible and reliable were, were two of the words. And of course, low carbon is, uh, are, the other, are the other two. And I think we need to actually reflect a little bit about how fortunate Scotland is. Geographically, surrounded by seas, surrounded by high winds, with the hydrocarbon resources that can be turned into blue hydrogen. Scotland has an awful lot of advantages that an awful lot of countries don't have. During the course of COP26, I've been meeting the delegations from various parts of the world, and you really do notice a difference. You notice the, the Americans and the British coming forward with, with a lot of tools, and then talking to delegations from Africa, South America, you notice a very different set of, set of abilities to, to move forward on this. So I think there's a real need, as, as, as the gentleman was saying, to bring people together and to, to support each other. At the moment, we've got a, a world where um, people here are literally concerned about the old, end of the world, but there are other people outside who are just concerned about the end of the month. And we need to bring that together. And countries that, like Scotland, can be a great place to test out hydrogen, a great place to develop wind, we also need to bring the rest of the world with us. I'd build on that if I may, Craig. I mean, I think, I think and, and this theme is coming out again and again tonight, there is also a mindset shift. We come from an industry which builds things that then push electrons or molecules into the world. And I don't think there is any other industry in the world that just produces stuff in the hope that somebody will consume it. And so again, and you talked about Spotify and Airbnb, 
there's a mindset shift to the consumer, understanding what the consumer wants, how we create an industry that, that incentivizes the behavioral changes that consumers can play. Now, that's not going to solve everything, but having a mindset that we just need to use lots of batteries, more batteries, bigger batteries, and, and that supply push is, is not on its own going to be the right answer. Certainly from my experience on the tour, um, the mindset thing was, was massive. It really was massive. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Well, we've got a couple of hands now. Great. Neil, I'll let you, I'll let you pick. Good evening. Um, Guilherme Castro, I'm chair of the YPN London. Um, congratulations, guys. Um, really well done. Um, I will bring more to the social aspect. I'm from Brazil, and I always try to think the transition in a different way because the problems that we have as a developing country, not only in Latin America, but Africa, and you mentioned this all, um, how we guarantee that this is a fair transition and um, that we, we won't test hydrogens, um, hydrogen and new technologies in the developed country, and then this will come down as a top-down technology transference rather than a collaboration, which is the re required um, perspective that I think would need the new mindset approach to guarantee that the Global South develop in the same pace and guarantee this leapfrog from the technology rather than a slow transition as any transition we had in the past happened to us. Um, open to, to any of you. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, actually, Al, I'm going to put you on the spot there because you're Equinor International. So. Um, <laughs> maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Certainly, and I'll, I'll use Brazil as the e example. I think there are a few things to this. I think, first of all, there's a responsibility from the countries and the companies that have done so well out of fossil fuels over the last few decades to do their bit. And, and that begins by lowering the carbon intensity of what we do in, in countries like Brazil. We are one of Brazil's biggest investors, the biggest energy investor, uh, uh, biggest foreign energy investor. The second piece is to look at technologies such as solar that um, can leapfrog Brazil forward so it doesn't have to go through the, the industrial solutions that, that, um, that the, um, the um, global north has, has, has been through. And then I think thirdly, there's the, the piece around what we advocate for in terms of policy. And one of the things we believe could really change things is, is a carbon tax. We, we come from Norway, where the carbon tax means that every time we emit um, a ton of carbon dioxide, we have to pay $80, going up all the time. It's going to go up to $200. We can still run a business, but it incentivizes us to drive down those emissions every day. And it's unusual to see companies asking for taxes. But in this case, we are. It will help us all on a level playing field to drive down those emissions and make sure we can do the same things in Brazil as we do in rich countries like Norway. Thanks, Al. We're going to go to the second question now that's been pre-recorded, and that's from our Middle East branch. And this question is on education. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Piotr Konopka, and I'm based in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. I am working as a senior manager for energy and decarbonization programs at DP World, and I'm also a board member of the Energy Institute Young Professionals Network here in the Middle East. Education is a crucial element in combating climate change. The video talked about reskilling and upskilling of the current workforce, which definitely has a huge role to play uh, in training the future generations as well as making a serious change today. I am hopeful that education around climate change will permeate throughout the society all the way from early stage curriculums to general awareness raising of the general public. We have recently held a Generation 2050 roundtable uh, about whether MENA can deliver on the net zero carbon ambition. And we have heard a question that we would also like to pose to the panel is whether education around climate change should be different between different cultures around the world. Thank you. That's a great question. And Ian, I'd like to pose that question to yourself, actually. Um, I, I think that edu what was it education on climate change, whether it should be different in different countries. I mean, I think that there is an element to which the science is, a, is the same, and so there's an element which will be similar. I think it needs to be culturally sensitive. 
and there are huge differences in different parts of the world with cultural mindset. Mindset seems to be the word of the night. But I think there are, you know, fundamentally different ways of approaching the problem, and, and not just through culture, as we've we've heard. Other countries in a completely different situation in terms of how they deal with the same issues. Scotland is, in terms of energy, has got all fantastic options, and it's a great opportunity for Scotland to be an experimental space to develop this, to, to pass this on. Other countries, I mean, I'm in Jordan, right? we import 93% of our energy, 93%, locked into long-term fossil fuel subsidies. So there's no incentivization for renewables. So, you know, you can't have the same conversation in Jordan as, as you would have here. Yeah. I think the, the, the thing I'd say about education is, is I think we need to think of it in two phases. We need to think of it you know, I said about the importance of the next five years. That's not going to be solved by putting edu climate change education into schools. Those, you know, by the time they're through, it's too late. So I think there has to be a thing where we target the people coming through now that are going to be the leaders in five, ten years. But I do think this is a long term, you know, we're in this for the long term. And so I think that we should permeate it into the schools because by 2050, 2060, we're going to, there will be different questions. And that set of people will have to have the answers to those to those different questions. So, you know, yes to it, but I don't think it's a, you know, the panace, you know, I don't think it's a kind of panacea in terms of putting it into the, say, the school system. Anna, as somebody who's just maybe come out of education, do you think that there was enough done about, enough talk about climate change and about the future from your time in school and your time in tertiary education? I think um, during my time in education, it was only just touched on slightly you know I remember being at school and I was made to build a green a greenhouse out of um, plastic bottles <laughs> that was kind of the basic the starting point of the climate change conversation in my primary school but now when you speak with young people they know so much you know they maybe know more than the older generation do now and I think that that you say the shift in mindset I think the shift in mindset maybe needs to come from the older generation because it's already there with the younger generation and yeah. their education is so much stronger around climate change but i think when it comes to climate change and um, affecting different cultures it really needs to to be conversations it shouldn't be a lecture on climate change it needs to relate to every single person's individual story because it's not a one-size-fits-all concept and every single person around the globe no matter what their background is is going to be impacted differently yeah. So I think that needs to be taken into consideration when it's been educated and it needs to be kind of remembered that, you know, there's so much going on and everyone is going to experience things differently. So I think it really needs to be brought into, into consideration. Yeah, great, great answers. I think we have time maybe for one final question from the audience. First hand I saw over there, yeah, let's go for it. Thank you. Evening all, uh, Don McAteer, Vice President of Energy for Worley. So kind of to a controversial question in the room. Great video, great conversation. We've still got a hydrocarbon industry, and we will for years to come. How do we work that together? You know, we talk about transition, skill changes, all these sort of things, but we've got to work the two hand in hand. And it's something I struggle with my business every day, electrification, remote operations of actual platforms and so forth. But, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. So asking the panels, how do you see that working over the next five to 10 years? I'm, I'm going to go to yourself again, Al, because I think Equinor is probably a, a good example of this. I, I, I think the first thing is to say you're absolutely right that the world will need hydrocarbons probably for the next few decades. And it's not something that's uh, a happy thing to say. It's something that it would be hugely disappointing to the vast majority of people at, at, at COP26. But faced with that as a reality, we then need to think very, very carefully about how do we minimize the carbon emissions associated with those fossil fuels. And that means educating consumers to demand a different type of, of energy. To use your analogy, you know, a, a meal that you'd eat in the 1980s you wouldn't know how many calories were in it. Today, you look at a packet, you can see exactly how many calories are in it. People should know how much energy they're consuming. And then secondly, to look at what we can do to reduce the energy associated with fossil fuels. I think carbon capture and storage 
is a great technology that we can use here in Scotland and worldwide. And thirdly, to make sure that for as long as we need fossil fuels, every one of us in the industry ensures that we emit as little carbon dioxide for the fossil fuels we use as possible. I think it's a great question. I, th I think there's also, you know, there's a, a portrayal of this sort of divergence and it's playing out this week here in Glasgow of you know, oil and gas this, renewables that, and, and people trying to drive a wedge through it. And I think this point of convergence, integration, I was at a, an event earlier today where yeah, people sort of talked about the integration of oil and gas and, and nuclear. And, it, and we have got to think about this integrated energy system and the role of creating electrons, molecules, heat, and, and that's got to come together. And we're only going to get that if we bring the industry together rather than try and drive a knife through the middle of it. I think that's a great place to finish, actually. This idea that we can bring it all together and not try and divide it up, use each other to help each other and get there together. Steve? Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm the president of the Energy Institute, Steve Holliday, so I've got the uh, great privilege of wrapping up this evening. And I'm not going to do my temptation, which is to try and pick up so many things. Uh, but I do want to say just congratulations to you guys. What a fabulous, fabulous film. And I really hope it's going to get the exposure that it deserves, actually, because it absolutely asks all the right questions. It touches on all the right points for me. I'm not going to go through them all again and repeat them. But there were two, actually, that I am just going to mention, which, uh, in amongst everything else you said, that really I was going, yeah, you know, that's true. And one of those things, of course, is just the reflection of yourselves. There's quite a few conversations going on this week, of course, about youth. Now, I'm quite old now, but the notion of actually the older generation, the more senior people in businesses, listening, listening and learning from the younger generation is something I've never really been exposed to for 40 years. And it's in a really exciting time, I think, when on this agenda in particular, as Anna just said as well, you know, how do we flip that round actually so the people who know so much more are driving things? So that's, I think, a huge challenge for the industry without question. The other thing that I just loved which everyone picked up on, including the academics, is just silos. So your notion of the energy industry learning from outside the energy industry, and as Nick and Al were just talking as well, how we actually break down the silos inside the industry itself. And if we don't do that, then we've really got a problem. Two huge agenda items for us, and I think they're sort of linked together. But thank you so much for a fantastic movie. Thank you so much for Scottish Power for actually hosting us this evening. Uh, thank you for SNAP and James Galbraith, who did an amazing job of editing that. I don't know how many hours of footage there obviously was. I'm sure it's yours, but thank you very much. And I'd like, if I may, just, just to give a certificate from the Energy Institute to five of the six who are here this evening. And, and just, just to say, for, for those that don't know, the Energy Institute has 11,000 members, but you can see this evening, actually, that our strength in our future lies in our YPN network. And you've had some people in the audience from our YPN network in London and elsewhere. You saw them on the video as well. You know, it gives me just great hope, actually. We've got so many enthusiastic people who want to get together, who want to collaborate. Uh, and this is just a great example of just how strong the YPN is, the YPN network, obviously, in Aberdeen and the islands. Uh, so if I could ask, first of all, Craig, I want to give you something, if I may. Craig, thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I said there were five of the six. The, the sixth member is Michael, actually, um, who's probably got the best excuse I, I can ever imagine for not being here. He's getting married. 
<laughs> so okay, anyway, we, we will get in that. And actually, there's a certificate there, but we've also got something else for you, which uh, I can't hand out on stage, it'd be inappropriate, which is a, a, a bottle of alcoholic beverage that hopefully you'll enjoy, that was made in Scotland, and has a lot to do about Ashley Renewables. But well huh. done. Thank you so much for all your hard work. And thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you very much.